Okay. If you uh, if you go to this link that I just put into the chat, um, then you'll find the uh, um, the slide deck that's behind me. <clears throat> I'm using this instead of Mural. It's it's a little easier for people to drive a, a Google Slides, I think, than Mural. And the needs are fairly simple for this. And if you go here, there's a couple things. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to use Zoom Screen Share because that takes all the power out of your hands and forces you to, to watch what I'm sharing, no matter what else you want to do. So what I'm doing is, is showing you, uh, you know, what the presentation through my video feed. So if you want to, you now right now it's probably, if you're a gallery view, it's too small. What you can do is you can pin my video and, you know, and, and hold it on the screen when you want to see that. And then unpin it when you want to look at other things or, or see what else is going on with everybody else. So that's one thing. Another thing is we, we may not have too much of a problem here. So if you have a question or a comment, then speak out. But if it starts getting congested, um, then we can go to a, a protocol of typing a Q in the chat. And then we can go take the questions in that order. Um, now, the next thing is making a name tag. And that starts on slide three where you can copy an avatar and then go to slides any of uh, four through uh, nine, I think it is, and paste the avatar on a name tag and, and add your name. So we've only got a few here. We've got plenty of name tags. I didn't know how many people were going to be showing up. George, we have 34 participants, by the way. So, so I prepared for 100. All right. So we, we should, be, should have plenty of uh, headroom here. And then, uh, then you can leave. Once you've done that, you can just park your browser on slide 10 until we get to the point of doing the breakout rooms. So, I can see there's a little activity in the name tags right now. Okay. Now I'm going to come down here in the corner so I don't block the whole slide. And so, so we're going to have a little fun here. We're going to take a trip down to Ocracoke Island, south of Cape Hatteras and meet some friends coming from, a, from South Carolina for dinner. It's, it'll be a fun little trip. Good to get out of your house. You've probably been cooped up in the house a lot. So we're going to do that. Now, what's the first thing that, that the kids say when you start out on a trip like that? It's kind of like when, when you start a software project, right? Are we there yet? Are we there, are, there yet? are we there yet? When are we going to get there? Are we there yet? 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 Not yet. Are we there yet? Not yet. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No, we are not. Are we there yet? No. 
So if you've got kids, you've been in that situation. If you were a kid, you probably put someone else in that situation. <laughs> so now if you, if you follow the typical advice for agile estimation, then you break the trip down into every little road segment and estimate each one and add them all up. And this, is, uh, this is the way we used to have to do things in the old days to figure out how far it was. Add all these, these mileages up and uh, to figure out how, how far it was. Um, but what are the problems with that? If you, uh, what if you uh, decide to take a different route? What if you miss one of these little numbers? That was real easy to do. So, so we're not gonna do that, but we're, we're gonna work in a little larger increments because what you really need to know are not how long it's going to take you to go down one, you know, between one intersection and the next, but you starting out, you need to know what time to leave. So here's what we know. We're going to start in DC. It's 364 miles if we go by the interstates and then down through Nags Head. And we've got young children, which adds its own complications. So what we want to do is figure out what's our estimated travel time. And while we're doing this, we want to record what assumptions do we make in the, those estimates. So if you go back to the, um, go back to the, to the participant deck, then we're going to go into breakout rooms. And what you want to do, go copy your name tag and take it to the slide for your breakout room. So say I was taking this one, then I, I could... Uh, uh, how do we know which breakout room we were in? Well, well once you get there, it'll, they'll be numbered. It'll tell you which number you're going to. So you can copy it in and move it where it's convenient. And then we've got these other cards over here to capture your assumptions during your, your conversation as you try, try to estimate how long this trip is going to take and therefore what time should you leave. So whatever assumptions you're, you're making, try to capture those. A lot of times when we're, when we're making estimates or plans, we don't capture what assumptions we're making, but those are gonna be important for our discussion tonight. So does that make sense? Everybody understand that? Yes. Who, who doesn't understand? Okay, so we'll spend 10 minutes doing this, trying to figure out how to, to estimate this. The breakout rooms will start with one. Um, this other one was just a phony to, uh, uh, for example, purposes. So body will, will put us into breakout rooms for 10 minutes. And in the breakout room, talk about, about how long the travel time will be and what time you want to start to get, get to dinner by 6.30 p.m. and capture the assumptions that you're making. Okay, ready? Paying attention to uh, the amount of time remaining. <laughs> I didn't know how to post my um, avatar. Uh, don't worry about it. We just all started diving in, making assumptions, and I was like, where do I post my avatar? <laughs> that was fun. It was fun. I loved it.
We needed we more time, though. So I no, it was good. <laughs> so, so did you come up with a plan? Oh no, we just came up with a lot of assumptions. <laughs> That's so, last time. so how long do you think it's going to take you? What was that? Sure, we're just going to teleport there. New technology. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> it took us three times the time than we anticipated earlier. Instead of two and a half hours, it was six and a half hours. Okay, I see Adam says nine and a half hours. That sounds about right. Take the worst case and the best case and um, average them. So do anybody have a, a time shorter than that? We had eight hours in breakout room four. Okay. Yeah, but I, a, a we didn't come time. up with a, a final count in the breakout room too. We didn't account for waiting for ferry as well. So what other times do people have? It's like Rajiv has about 10 hours, 10 and a half hours. So, and what time, so we, uh, Rajiv is planning to leave at 8 a.m. What time does everybody else think of leaving? Day before. I proposed early morning in breakout room too, but we never discussed the start time, I guess. But with my don't ever head, Don't ever head south from DC on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's a terrible idea, yeah. Yep. And that same goes for going north, too. I mean, if you were headed to Maine uh, <laughs> from DC, Friday afternoon evenings are really bad. You'll get stuck in traffic just like crazy. But not with COVID. It's much better now. <laughs> I'll have to agree to that statement. <laughs> So, so it looks like we've got uh, uh, 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. Anybody have a time, or a leaving time earlier or later than that? Hello, Moto. We had 8.30 a.m. 8.30? So does anybody have your start time plus your travel time Exactly equal 6.30 p.m. So why not? Because the, probably because the ferry, the, the most appropriate ferry was a 4.30 ferry that gets you on to Ocracoke at 5.30. We, um, we didn't uh, get to an actual departure time, but we did talk about not trying to catch the last ferry, that we were gonna plan our day out to catch the second to last ferry that would get us there in time for dinner. So we, we intentionally put a buffer in there to just in case anything happened. Okay. And Mark, that's the 4.30 ferry, right? Not the 5.30 ferry. I thought we saw four o'clock, but whichever that was, yeah. Did, did anybody plan to uh, to stop for lunch along the way? And are you going to stop at a fast food place, or are you thinking of going going a little off the highway and and getting a real meal? Sandwiches from the cooler, man. Got to be got to be snappy. NASCAR pit stop stops. Uh, we, we had an in, in room, breakout room too, we had a number of discussions around how many breaks um, based on how old the kids were. So we didn't break lunch out into a separate category, but we definitely talked about how much we would be stopping. And do you plan to get gas along the way? Of course. 
that's what's a stop. What, what, yeah, There's it's food one, in that little gas snack. shop, right? Yeah, it's like a snack <laughs> shop. Uh, I don't care how nasty the bathroom is, use it. So you strap the kids to the top of the car and you put the extra <laughs> gas in the car. So, <laughs> no, we drive with They're also seat. not top heavy that way. Yeah, it's, I like that hybrids. Yeah. So, so when you when you're planning your your uh, software development projects, do you <laughs> are you this optimistic? <laughs> Heck no. How, how about you know we're going all this way? Do we want to take some time to get off the highway and and see some scenery along the way? Maybe there's you know there's some special attractions that we'd want to stop by and, and see since we're in the area. George, are you trying to suggest that there's more than the next milestone in life? <laughs> and there is in software development projects also. So, you know, and, and to be honest, stopping at the uh, Wright Memorial is really ideal because at that point, you know, you've got a pretty good idea of how long it's going to take you to get to the ferry landing. You're pretty close to it by then. That's in Kill Devil Hill. You can fly into there as well. There's an airstrip there. So just FYI, <laughs> the flying approach is looking better and better. So the thing is, is on your trip, you want to be aware, you know, the, the estimates are not just for, for at the beginning and to decide what time to, to leave. But you also need to, to keep track of how you're doing along the way. Um, I heard a little bit of stuff on, uh, you know, about leaving some extra time for things that might happen. So a little bit of that in the chat. <clears throat> but along the way, you know, the, there may be other things that come up that are threats to, to your project, to your trip. And there may be opportunities that if you're in a rush and you're paying attention to, to getting there in the shortest time possible, you may miss completely. And you've got people depending on you. They're going to be there waiting for you for dinner. How do you know if you're going to meet your plan or not? And when do you know? If you've only estimated the whole trip, then, well, if you've estimated, what did we estimate? Eight, eight and a half hours? And eight and a half hours goes by and, and you're not there yet, then you know your estimate's wrong. And that seems a little late. So the, how can, you can tell is you can compare your estimate to your actuals. That's information. That's not, that's not an I indication of, of bad estimation. It's an indication of incorrect assumptions. You know, you may have had past experience of thinking that you could do average 50 miles an hour. And that's a pretty good rough planning number. I've used that before. Makes the math easy. Um, before they lowered the speed limits, I used to use 60 miles an hour because you, you know, a, a mile a minute made real easy math. But that may not be true on this particular day. And how soon can you tell? Well, maybe you want to estimate something a little before. What if we, why don't we estimate how long it's going to take us to get to, to Fredericksburg? That'll give us some information, right? And a lot better information than the little two mile, three mile increments that, that are printed on the map. So how long would it take you to drive from, from, from uh, I-495 
down to the Route 1 crossing just south of Fredericksburg. You've pro probably a lot of you have done that trip. It's like eight hours on a typical day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Friday afternoons without COVID, yes. Well, the, the thing, is, the good thing here is we want to want to be in North Carolina for dinner, so you're going to have to leave earlier than the afternoon. <laughs> well, so I mean, the interesting thing is, what does how long it takes you to get to to Route One tell you about how long it's going to take you to get the rest of the distance, given you know typical traffic around DC? So, so I so, um, yeah, we'll get to that. So, what does it mean? What if, it, if it takes you three hours to get to get to Fredericksburg? What does what does that mean for the rest of the trip? Maybe nothing. Maybe because the landscape changes after that. Perhaps I mean I don't mean and I don't mean the landscape of you know the topographical landscape. I mean that getting from Fredericksburg to Williamsburg. Is a bit different than getting from 495 to Fredericksburg. Yeah. So if you if you keep your 65 mile an hour estimate, and you re you would have to reset it after getting to Route One, right? And if it took you three hours to get to Route One, that's probably going to push your arrival time back by two. Uh, I'll chime in and say that well, there are some parts of of 95 that are slower and faster depending on the traffic, it's fair to say that your average velocity is probably going to be pretty similar throughout the trip. Well, you know, you, you could do, you can even take a shorter thing, uh, segment here. My feeling is getting past Occoquan is the, uh, the first big hurdle. Uh, that's a typical place where things back up. Fredericksburg is another. I've never ever traveled on I-95 without getting stuck in an accident. And so that average throw goes out of the window. <laughs> That's the major obstacle on I-95. And I've, I traveled a lot on I-95. Okay. So, so you want to plan time for, for an accident in addition to the driving time? Yes, that's that's good. What if the, what if the delay getting to Fredericksburg was due to a flat tire? Well, that's when you take one of the kids and you wrap them around that tire and you just <laughs> keep on trucking. Well, I I would presume that you've got one spare. <laughs> My point is, child. <laughs> And, but you, then you have to assume how long it's going to take you to change that spare. Do you change it yourself or are you calling AAA? Well, it, I mean, this happens. Yeah. I didn't you know, and it takes you some time. What's that? I didn't even factor in um, accidents or unexpected events. Um, I mean, that, that wasn't part of the scope, I thought. <laughs> oh. Does it? Was that bad? Do you, do you ever have software projects that are that are planned with, you know, with <laughs> that everything's going to go right? Right. All of them. I mean, those dedicated employees that don't take vacation or go on holiday. Absolutely. Why would you plan to fail and make mistakes? So, so a flat tire. I mean, that's a that's a one time delay. Um, it's going to cost you some time. Uh, What's like that in, in software development? Things breaking. Uh, any, production issues. Any particular server goes down. Yeah. yeah pro production issues of any. GitHub is inaccessible for a half a day. So Another thing that could happen is, is that you've got a, a bunch of periodic events. What if you've got a car sick child? You don't quite know how often it's going to happen, but it's going to, it might happen more than once. And the first time it happens might give you some indication that it's going to happen again. 
And as you go further, you might get some sense of how often it happens. In a, in a software project, that might be a lack of familiarity with a new platform. And so you're going along just fine and then all of a sudden you hit a problem that you don't know how to solve. And you try a bunch of stuff and you ask around and eventually you figure out how to do that in, in this platform and you go on until you run into the next thing you don't know how to do. What about something like this? You're trying to go too fast and that ends up slowing you down. You know, maybe you're, you're cutting corners on, on uh, getting everybody to know exactly what we're trying to do. And then that ends up slowing you down. Maybe you're working on a legacy code base and you keep coming into surprises that, that you didn't know about in that code base. What about slow traffic? What if we we're just going slower than we thought we could go? Maybe the decision makers are, are slow to get back to you with answers. Have you ever had that happen on a software project? Yes. <laughs> Frequently. And then there's, you know, things totally go haywire. Maybe, uh, maybe the algorithm you'd come up with work fine on your test data, but when you start trying to use live data on it, you find it's not giving you the answers you want. It worked in theory. But there's a problem and, and you've got to figure that out and go on. Maybe you need to choose a different route, a different algorithm. How many of you have uh, gotten, gotten off of I-95 at, at Fredericksburg and gone down Route 1 because I-95 was just backed up? Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> so, you know, the actual time and the reason for that actual time may, may make you change your assumptions for the next leg. You know, if you get to Fredericksburg and there's been really heavy traffic, do you then think, oh, well, there'll be all the traffic's north of Fredericksburg, so so south of Fredericksburg, it's going to be smooth sailing. Does that make sense? So and then I, you, I mean, what? I'm just thinking as we discuss this, that's why uh, predictive analytics is so important. <laughs> um, if you use predictive analytic tools and AI tools to uh, mitigate uh, risk and make a proper assessments. Well, a AI tools are no, are, you know, they're dependent on the assumptions built into them also. Right, exactly. Trained models, right. And, and so they, the, if your situation is different from the situation that they've been trained on, mm -hmm. then um, I would not rely too heavily on, on their predictions. Amen. I mean, we're living through it now with uh, what is that, Waze and all these uh, mobile apps? <laughs> so, uh, Fadi, this is uh, supposed to wrap up at seven. Can't hear you. 
No, we wrap up between 7 and 7.30, so. Okay. We can go till 7.30 if uh, that's where you are. Well, I'm, uh, I just, I decided to skip the second breakout uh, because I think we're getting the, the information. We don't need to, to uh, spend time estimating this. And I was noticing it's, it's getting close to seven anyway. And I think we're doing better with, with uh, whole group discussions given the size of the group. All right, sounds good. So, so the point here is that our, our goal really is to have dinner with our friends and also to enjoy the trip. This is supposed to be an happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue about who wrecked who. <laughs> so if you decide that, that your plan isn't working, what can you do about it? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, Call well, our friends and yep. see if we can do breakfast in the Saturday morning. Adjust. <laughs> the first thing a lot of people reach for is to try harder. Maybe that's how you get the speeding ticket. And if you get a speeding ticket north of Fredericksburg, what's that mean when you get down in southern Virginia? <laughs> and this is the second thing people usually reach for. Well, whose fault was it? Well, if you hadn't taken so long at lunch, if you hadn't gotten car sick, but neither of those help. But yeah, reassessing and replanning. And the thing is, sometimes, some, you know, you have a flat tire. Well, you don't expect that's going to mean that you have more flat tires unless you've been driving around a construction site lately. It could mean that. But if you've got some contingency buffer in your plan, then you can deal with that. But sometimes it affects the, you know, the overall time, the, the overall rate in which you're traveling, and you don't have enough contingency for that. And so one of the important things about figuring out early that your plans aren't working is so that you can let people know early. You don't want to wait till two weeks before a software deployment to say, oh, it's going to take us another six months. That tends to not be a happy situation. So, Lisa, you, you said this in the chat. I did. I'm putting it in French, so nobody knows. La merde. No, je parle français, moi. Qu'est-ce que vous voulez raconter? La merde arrive. Je ne parle pas. So, it's more polite in French, right? No. <laughs> But the. One of the things is, that people forget is estimates are not plans. So estimates are ba based on your assumptions. They're what you think. And your plans are, are, you probably want them to be a little robust. You, you yeah. probably want to let uh, your estimates inform your plans. And if you start out estimating what's the shortest time we can get to our destination and then treat that as a plan, then you've guaranteed a, a, a death march from the very beginning. <laughs> How many of you have seen people do that? Seen, yes. seen? Oh my God, yeah. I can relate. 
It's, it's just a notional estimate. We won't hold you to it. And well, yet, when you see the... <laughs> and yet it turns into a plan magically. Well, you really need to keep those separate. Maybe you need to, when you give the estimate, then also give some stuff, some plans to go along with it. Okay, we estimate it's gonna take this long, but we also need this much contingency planning and buffer for the things that, that we don't know about. And this one is so hard for software development organizations. When the estimates and the reality differ, believe the reality. You know, it's not, it's not that people are going slower on purpose. It's, <laughs> it's that the estimate didn't take into account some things that happened. It, the estimate was based on faulty assumptions. It was based on the fact that, that nobody was going to take a vacation or nobody was going to leave for another job or nobody was going to make a mistake or that we really knew what we were trying to build in the first place. You don't really need to know what's going to go wrong to know that something's going to go wrong. But, but the, the, whole, the real point of this uh, talk is that estimates make your assumptions measurable. If you say, oh, we can get this feature done in two weeks and it takes you three weeks, that's a good time to stop and, and say, oh, why did it take us three weeks? That's not the time to say, oh, we have to work faster to make up the lost time. That's going to be one of those things that costs you over and over and over again if you try to do that. Because you're going to make more mistakes if you're in a hurry. So you can measure your, you know, the accuracy of your assumptions by the difference between the estimates and the actual. And then use that to go find what assumptions did we make that were not, not true? What happened that surprised us? And this is why I was trying to have you, you write down your, your assumptions. Because if you can capture them at the time, it's a lot easier to identify what those assumptions might have been. But even if you don't, you can think back and you in the major ones that are wrong, you, you should be able to think of. But we didn't realize the code was in this bad a shape. I thought this new new package everybody's raving about was going to be easy to use. That's what it says on the web. <laughs> and it's the plans you should adjust. Adjust your plans to achieve your goals. Oh, well, maybe we can't make 6.30 dinner. Would, uh, would an eight o'clock dinner be okay? I think somebody suggested, oh, we, let's make it breakfast. So what do you think? Do you think that estimates can actually help you as you're producing the software? We're resounding yes. You know, so estimates get, get uh, a bad rap, particularly in agile circles. And I think that's mostly because, um, well, there's several things. One, people forget that, that 
plans and estimates are different. And so, so, um, and there's this, I don't know where it comes from, this idea that we want to do everything as fast as possible, rather than as well as possible. And then too many organizations just are in the habit of blaming people. And that's the really sad part. And that was actually the reason I wrote this book is because I see, see organizations where, where people are blaming each other and better estimates won't prevent that, I tell you. That's a different problem. But I think you can use estimates. And one thing is, if you notice early that your estimates are not panning out, that there are faulty assumptions in your estimates, then you can say, hey, we need to replan. And if you do that early, then it's a whole lot easier to replan than if you're doing it late. And that's the whole point of transitioning from waterfall to agile. So, I mean, I mean, I love, I mean, even if you get it wrong with estimation, you got to start somewhere. Right. And analysis is better before rather than later. And you might you might say, oh well, let's cut let's cut this release down a bit. Let's take some features out. Or you might say, oh, maybe we need to uh, maybe we need to rethink how we're building this. Maybe we don't need to. Maybe our first release doesn't need to be to scale to millions of people. Maybe we can create a simpler version that does all the same things. But in smaller but, iterations. Right. For testing purposes. So there are a lot of things depending on the situation. So. Me, 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 I want a book. <laughs> I went, I went immediately and, and tagged everything, Twitter, LinkedIn, comments, shared, liked, <laughs> me, me. <laughs> All right, any, any more questions for George? Yeah, George, I've got a question. This has been a good event, by the way. Uh, what is the best way, in your opinion, to provide estimates that can be useful to a business without committing to those estimates? Because as you've said, that distinction between an estimate and a plan is very challenging to establish. So what are your recommendations and best practices there? Well, I don't think there is a best practice because this depends so much on the recipient of the information. You know, and some people say, oh, well, you should always give a three-point estimate, you know. But I find that those are mostly phony because you've come up with an estimate and then you've added and subtracted from that just to give a range. Um, I don't do three independent estimates myself. I've never done that. <laughs> um, you know, that sort of thing can help. Getting different people to help estimating using different techniques it can help show up where you know, there could be a problem. I would tend to say, okay, you know, we've got these estimates and, and show the deep, more detailed estimates, not just one number overall. And from this, I suggest a plan like this and put in, put in contingency buffers. How big do you think you need your contingency buffers to do, be? And that, of course, is an estimate too. Um, back when I started in, in, um, uh, in engineering, then, you know, you'd get these, you know, lists of pithy sayings from, from seasoned project managers that get faxed around and they use, you know, a lot of them had something about contingency buffers in there. Um, you know, I learned early on that, that you know, one rule of thumb was to take your estimate and triple it. 
Um, years ago, a guy I met on on uh, on uh, uh, rec dot boats said, "Well, on boating projects, he would take the the number he estimated for a boat project, triple the number, and increment the unit of measurement." So something that he thought was going to take an hour took three days. And, you know, there's a lot of truth to that, <laughs> you know, because you think about the, you know, the actual working time when you're making, uh, no, it's, well, it's padding the, the plan, not the estimate. This is the thing. If you start fudging the numbers in your estimate, then you can't tell what's going on anymore. You know, then, oh, well, we happen to, to uh, you know, this estimate was exactly right. And people forgot that it, it was really padded to become a plan. So they think, oh, our estimation is good. So we can, we can estimate right on the money. So the next time somebody else estimates and they don't pad anything. Plus you run into the problem, oh, these people always pad their estimates. So therefore I'm gonna have it. <laughs> so keeping estimates and plans distinct I find to be one of the most useful conversations to have. Um, a lot depends on the, uh, you know, the experience and expertise of the people you're talking to. Somebody with a brand new MBA, you know, they just want to do it in a spreadsheet because that's all they were taught. Thank you. Adam, I think you've seen that <laughs> by your face. I, I am an MBA holder, and I got so upset in my business school's project management class because they were just teaching the equations out of the book. I got everybody in the class to write a horrible write-up for the class, and it got removed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. I was popular with that teacher, by the way. <laughs> Any more questions for George? George, just a quick comment your, about estimates and the, having your plan, your estimate maybe be 30% of what your plan is because of some unknowns. The analogy that was popping into my head was like my friend that's a chef and has his own restaurant, right? His food costs might be 30% of what the menu item is, but you're paying for that service, you're paying for that experience. And to me, that kind of sounded similar to kind of, you're not just paying for the code being written, but you're paying for other things and other you know, things in that ecosystem. Right. And, and not all of the food that a restaurant buys it ends up being served to, to the customers. That's true in software development too. There's some dead ends. So, you know, sometimes you have to back up and try again. You know, uh, dishes get burned. <laughs> I, I encourage my teams that when they go down those dead ends to think about what they learned on their way and not think of it as such a, uh, as a failure per se, but what did we learn in pursuit of that failure perhaps? Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's what this talk is about, is, is, and even expecting these things to happen so that you can learn it earlier, because you're looking for it. it it's not when a server is going to go down. It's not if a server is going to go down. It's when the server is going to go down, for example, because it will happen. It's, you know, give it enough time, it's bound yeah. to. And if it's not a server going down, well, you know, there's something else that's going to happen. You know, the router dies. Somebody trips over a cable. Some, somebody uh, spills their Coke on something. So, um, Toby, I think there are a lot of industry sources out there that people will sell you. Um, I don't know how good they are. Um, because they'll tell you they're good, but how they've collected a lot of data, you know, uh, you look at Capers Jones, he's collected a huge amount of data from, from large projects, mostly government projects, I think, 
and built that into a model to calculate how long it's going to take to do a software project. And, and there are so many tweaks to it, you know, well, what, what language are you writing it in? What's the experience of your programmers? And they quant quantify all this to put it, use it as input on the model. So then if it, the estimate comes out wrong, they can just say, oh, well, you put bad data in the model. So I don't know if any reliable data. The, the best data is, you know, what this same team has done on other projects. Yes, yeah. And that's one reason why I highly recommend keeping teams together, having durable teams so that you have some idea about how well they work together. Plus, it's, it takes time and effort to get people working well together. Yeah. If they're not working well together, yeah, break that team up. I've seen on, on my teams where we have the same group of six or seven, eight developers, but you split them up into different subgroups and mix up those, mix up the makeup of who's working with whom among those subgroups and things change drastically about how well they work together. There's, there's no way anyone should compare estimation skill outside of a stable development team, in my opinion. I, I one time was, um, uh, it was, was brought in by a large corporation and um, the, uh, I went up and I spoke with one of their managers and um, to talk with him about, you know, how he could, you know, to teach him what Agile was because he didn't, he didn't know anything about it really. Um, it had a book thrown at him, I think, but, but I go up and I'm talking to him and I find out that he was in the process of estimating a new project. And he didn't know what the requirements were. He had a vague idea of what the project was about, but he didn't, didn't have the requirements. They hadn't been decided yet. They were just, you know, this was an internal project and they just started talking to the, to the business stakeholders about what they really needed. He didn't know who was going to be writing the software. He thought it was probably going to be you know, one of several contracting companies they had used before in Eastern Europe, but that hadn't been decided yet. And he was on the hook for coming up with, with an estimate of time and costs plus or minus 3%. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, that's crazy. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, this would be part of his evalu evaluation as a manager was to be within that range. If he brought it in more than 3% under the estimate, then he got dinged for that too. And I told him, well, your, your only hope is to overestimate and sandbag and make it come in right on time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, companies have some really unrealistic expectations sometimes. Yep, I think we can all relate. All right, uh, thanks a lot, George. Uh, please unmute your mic so we can give George a big round of applause as we wrap things up. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we're gonna do the uh, book drawing. So if you can uh, pick a number between one and uh, 14, George, one and 14. Twain, one and 14. Well, everybody knows the most random number in the world is seven, but I'll pick 10. 10, Lisa, are you still with us? Lisa Newman, did you log off? Lisa logged off, so we're going to go to the uh, next uh, person on the list. Uh, Drew. Drew G. Yes, hey. All right, Drew. Thank uh, you, excellent. Congrats. And uh, just uh, I'll, I'll ping you, and uh, you can decide if you want a physical copy or a uh, um, Kindle copy. And we'll connect you from there. So congrats, uh, congrats to you as well.
All right, everybody. Thanks, uh, George, for uh, your presentation. Thanks, everybody, for joining. A uh, quick reminder that uh, on October 9th, we're having a lunchtime event with uh, Surab Salimi. And then on October uh, 19, we're having an evening event, but we're going to start promptly at 5 p.m. and then have networking after uh, the talk is over. We're going to have um, Eric Bueller presenting um, at that event as well. Uh, thanks all for joining. and.